Hey everyone, I'm Andres. Welcome to an episode of The Critic Corner. If you're not familiar with The Critic Corner, that means you're missing out on my exclusive podcasts that are only at www.theandresegovia.com because this is the kind of stuff that I do not post on YouTube and I do not post on The Andres Segovia Show podcast proper. But this is this episode is an exception because I felt I needed to address Tenet because there's a lot that's been talked about it, both pros and cons, and I felt I needed to weigh in on it. Particularly because I did an episode earlier this year where I brought on a buddy of mine named Russell, and we discussed all of Nolan's films. We ranked them based on the the number one all the way to ten, uh, when we shared our list respectively, and also did a follow up uh, episode discussing the Dark Knight trilogy that was not included in those top ten. That was in in preparation for Tenet. Now that Tenet's out, uh, available on the digital DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, and all that stuff, uh, people have been able to see it, and they come away with the pros and cons of the movie for themselves. So I felt now it's proper for me to talk about this. So in order for me to talk about it, uh, I asked my other buddy, Travis, to come on and talk about it because he and I had differing perspectives um, about the film. So uh, here's my discussion with him, but let me just forewarn you now. One, this is filled with spoilers, not just for Tenet, but basically the entire body of work of Christopher Nolan, because you cannot talk about Tenet without weighing it against his other uh, properties, just like everybody else has. Everybody talks about his other movies in reference to Tenet. So it's unavoidable. We discuss the other movies, and we do go into deep uh, discussions of plot points and key moments in certain films of all of his all of his body of work, uh, the Dark Knight notwithstanding. So, just giving you the warning uh, that here on out that there's going to be a bunch of spoilers about a lot of his movies, and there are a couple of things I want to clarify. So, at the end of my discussion with Travis, uh, I'll be end capping it with a couple of clarifications that came up during my conversation with him that I did not clarify during the call with him. So, I wanted to clarify it here. Anyway, without further ado, here is my conversation with Travis regarding Tenet and the best and the worst of. Christopher Nolan. But let's get talking about this tenant thing. The because the issue that people have generally had, they say it's a high concept that falls flat. And I guess I could summarize the arguments in this way, because if they say high concept and he was more focused on the concept, so it was it was more um, style over function, if you will, to use a design choice there. And I actually disagree for various reasons because of the subject matter of the film but i think you represent the the general audience and when i say general audience i actually mean like the maybe 50 people that got to see it so far (laughs) and and i was happy to see it i want to say i was very glad uh, especially during this year anything new especially from christopher nolan so i was actually grateful that, that i did get to uh did get to see it was on the highlights of this year. Yeah, uh, but uh, you're, like, you were telling me that uh, your issues with the film is that there was really no character or character growth per se, at least for the protagonist, whose literal name is the protagonist. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, like, it's, it's just some some people didn't see anything in terms of growth there. It, I don't know if it's so much growth. He just didn't... Um... I, I was trying to think because I was uh, – so I remember when I was watching it because it's, it's a fairly long movie and I was 20, 30 minutes into it and I was aware at one point. It's been you know, a little while since I saw it, but I remembered I was like 20, 30 minutes into it and that I was having trouble getting into it, which I usually don't have any issues, especially with a, you know a Nolan movie and it just wasn't – it wasn't bad. It wasn't like, uh, oh gosh, I could just leave the theater. But I realized I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't like locked into it. And there was something about the main character, the protagonist, uh, since that's his actual name. He just, I, I, I'm not, and I'm not quite sure what it is. I'll have to watch it again. He just never grabbed me. And I don't have a problem with, um, with an archetypal kind of uh, character. A lot of times you'll have a kind of like a silent kind of character that represent something maybe in like a i don't know like a an assassin movie or you know uh, like a samurai movie or something like that but uh i felt like a lot kind of rested on him that you needed to you needed to be drawn to his character and if anything uh i thought robert pattinson was a better part of the of the, of the movie i don't think um what 
I, I feel really bad at forgetting uh, his name. What's what, what's the actor's Neil. name who played the protagonist? Oh, protagonist. Yeah, okay. Um, no, no, no. That was yeah. the, the, the protagonist. Let me get his, his name. I, I keep trying to call him Denzel. He's Denzel. Like, his name. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm always tired of calling him like, uh, and Denzel's son. I was like, what, what's his name? I keep forgetting whatever his name is. Yeah, and I should know it by now, man. I've said his, I've said his name so many times. Like, dude, what the flip is your name? I know you're Washington. John David. John David. Okay. For for me, I, I felt like there were, there were three problems with, with, with the movie. Him, uh, it's, this is all going to be about character people's names. I don't know him, uh, Kenneth Branagh, who played the villain, and the lady who played his uh, wife. Wife. That trio didn't pull me in. I wasn't drawn to the protagonist character, and even though I thought the lady that plays wife actually did a good job, no, um, Kenneth Branagh is it's always is always an interesting character. Their dynamic didn't work for me, and so it just. It didn't pull me into it the way, um, like when you're watching Interstellar and the uh, Matthew McConaughey Murph relationship kind of worked in that movie. You you had something where one his performance alone, even if you thought there were problems with Interstellar, I feel like his performance alone almost kind of overshadows the other problems. You almost forget about the other problems because it's just so um, it just pulls you pulls you in, and then you had that dynamic. Some of the dynamics in the movie just I'll have to go back and watch it. They weren't bad. I didn't like. Oh, I gave a bad performance. It just, it didn't draw me in, and it didn't. It just didn't work for me because, like I said, I, I like movies. I put something like uh, maybe like Blade Runner, where you have like Harrison Ford, whose whose character is kind of uh, that the strong silent type. So it it wasn't about that. That he didn't have a major character arc, or that you know he didn't have big showy dialogue scenes. It just it didn't pull me into. The espionage kind of world. I, I realized like 45 minutes in the film, an hour into the film, I was intrigued by what was going to happen with the the time travel stuff, especially when it's it kind of started getting it's back into, you know, into into some of the stuff that uh, I was I was like, okay, I'm interested where this was going to go, but I wasn't really interested in what was happening to uh, the characters so much. And it was just – it was a problem for the whole movie. I got, I got done with it, and someone said, well, what did you think of it? And I was like, oh, it was good. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Did you think it was – like, where would you rank it? And and, and it was weird because you know, I was excited, and I was talking with people about it, but I also kind of immediately knew I went, it's not up there with how I felt about – and you know, I could name several of his uh, similar, similar films, even like The Prestige. Um, which I was more drawn into with the back and forth between uh, Christian Bale and, 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 and Hugh Jackman. Something I felt like it 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 had some of the same problems that I had a little bit with Interstellar. He got he keeps going bigger and bigger with with the concept of, of the movie, and he has a little bit of a bad habit, I think, of letting things get a little bloated because he's so technical. He's figuring out his timelines and where things need to be that. He doesn't focus on some of the details that he does when, say, you go back to an early film like Memento, where there's just tons of little character details. You can watch that yes. for the sixth time, and you're like, there'll be some little tiny motif, and you just have these tiny little things that character does throughout all the scenes. You're like that, he was just really interested in the character, and I think he, I think it's kind of like it if you would go back to that, like, go, okay, I've gone big, 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 big. I'd almost love it if you would go back and do a really kind of detailed film uh, uh, again, because he's kind of like. He reminds me of like Stanley Kubrick. You remember like how Stanley Kubrick he developed such a reputation at one point that um, it was almost like he was kind of setting himself up for failure. Where critics were they weren't happy with what he was presenting them. Like he do some film and it couldn't just be a film. It couldn't be good. It had to be amazing and unique. And he would deliver something that was amazing and unique. And yet there was always a problem with it. And then it would take ten, twenty years. And people go once they would accept it for what it was. They go, oh, well, this is amazing. But they'd yeah, see The Shining and go. That wasn't scary, and you try to explain to him. Well, that wasn't the point. That's not what he's doing. No, no, it wasn't scary. And you see Barry Lyndon. That wasn't exciting. Well, that's not what. He's... So I'm willing to give Interstellar a chance. Like maybe I'm not accepting it for what it was, but those were my genuine first impressions of it. You mean Tenet? You said Interstellar. Or, I'm sorry. Yes, Tenet. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, I have to. Okay, it's, this is almost like a, a triple layer uh, 
defense and discussion because there's ten at the movie. Uh, Nolan's works as a whole, and uh, the most obvious comparison, which would be uh, Inception, I guess slash Interstellar. So mm-hmm. let me let me take it with uh, his body of work first to to I guess lay down the groundwork to then I guess understand for why everything they did with Tenet was classic Nolan. It was him showing his strengths. And like I said, the statement from the critical drinkers, what I agree with, the best and the worst of Nolan. I agree with the statement. I didn't agree with the arguments that uh, um, uh, the critical drinker was breaking down because you're breaking down uh, not so much aesthetically, but similar to the, the comments you were making regarding character in this. So as a whole, his, his body of work, I'd say the last pure Christopher Nolan movie was The Prestige. That was the last one. After that, it became more blockbuster stuff for why some people lament that um, he was no longer an independent filmmaker. He was more of the grandiose, like, a big budget film guy. Uh, but he showed that he can still he can still tell a well crafted story uh, with a big budget. Uh, hence, Inception is how some people see it—an original property that required that kind of budget to tell something that complex that uh, you don't normally see. <clears throat> Now, with respect to what makes Nolan classic, uh, there's a distinct sound, a distinct approach, a, dis- a distinct uh, restraint with cinematography that it sounds fantastic, but yet somehow it's stylistic. I've always found that interesting. It's not crazy camera tricks here and swooping whatever. No, but somehow his cinematographer that ends up – the last movie they end up doing together I think was um, – his name is Wally something. Uh, it starts with a P, doesn't it? The, his his last Wally. name. His last name with a P, but it's, I think it's silent. Wally something because he ended up becoming his own director. He did that uh, uh, um, uh, a movie with Johnny Depp where Johnny Depp downloads his consciousness into the uh, into some servers. The movie was a bust. But the thing is that he, he had a great eye. So I think the last did they one... Did do Dunkirk together? No. I think the last one might have been The Dark Knight. Um, if not The Dark Knight Rises. I, I could be wrong. But... Um, it's that prestige being the last one of its kind. My issue that I've had, notwithstanding with the with the Batman movies, my issue with Nolan in general have been two principal things. One, his sound mixing, which is going to come into big play with all of his movies. But sound mixing, for why Interstellar was finally the one where like, okay, fine, I accept it because of what he said. Two, emotional connections to characters you can have characters do some growth you can tell a story and i won't give a damn because it's not interesting the character is not interesting so that's something that has happened with nolan um i would point to inception being that one i was more interested in the concept of inception i was not invested with Leonardo DiCaprio's emotional arc because I didn't feel the emotional arc in fact I felt he overacted a lot of it but yet he was nominated because of course um, it, it took it took a long time I would say it I would say 10 years for me to watch it again and start feeling something for Leonardo DiCaprio's cop before that I I just didn't care and every side character that I absolutely enjoy except Ellen Page Eddie, her her dialogue was so heavy handed and 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 just like the worst line that she says that always irks me when I watch Inceptions. Like, dude, this is you you did it. okay. That was too heavy handed, uh, uh, Nolan. I don't know how you thought that was gonna sound great. It's when they go into the the snow level in in that dream state, and as soon as they appear, we see. Um, uh, we see Leo with a with a um, looking through the scope of a, of a snapper rifle, yeah. And then she says, "What's down there? Whatever we want Fisher to see." No, I mean, what's down there for you? Who was supposed to infer that? But he uh, and uh, this, I'm going to throw this one to you. So, if there's one problem I have throughout what I call the we'll call it the post Noah movies. I think I'll agree with you. We'll say the Prestige is the last pure movie of his. Um, I feel like the Batman series carried over into some of his other works, and one of the problems I had with some of his movies was the dialogue. And the issue I had was I, I there were a couple moments like in in both uh, Inception and Interstellar where I went, I think you could have gotten away with that dialogue in the Batman series in 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 a in a comic book universe movie, and you're trying to import it 
into you know something that's a little more gritty and, and realistic. And he likes to have characters who kind of do these like I, I like do kind of these, these big dramatic. I, I call them more like comic book kind of dialogue right. of, of how you of how you get across um, big thematic points. And in his better movies, I just sort of ignore it. Like they're there, but I would never point to him as a criticism. I go, yeah, they're there, but it, just, it didn't bother me. But it's kind of all throughout his his movies. Actually, he did a little bit better job in Tenet than he had before. But I don't know. Did, did you notice that? Because it was a problem with me at points in both Inception and Interstellar, where I was like, okay, well, you're really putting some heavy handed dialogue in in the characters. Like you really want that moment. I feel like he's going for like a like this is the Academy Award moment, and he's gonna have characters give some great philosophical thing. And it's I, I find he doesn't pull off those. That would be Inception. Moments kind of well. I, I I do not I do not have any issues. Well, for the most part, uh, with Interstellar, um, that one is what I consider uh, the pinnacle of what he ach- achieved. Because I said the issue that I had with him was sound mixing, and second was um, uh, was this connection to characters. And I guess along with that, uh, I don't know if I will uh, I will put it up there with sound mixing because it kind of plays to that point that you made regarding dialogue. That's actually been his issue since Memento, where I felt that he he wants a distinct distinct way to be said so strict because when you um i don't know if it was in the making or the or or the 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 film commentary uh and it's the scene of the opening scene or with the spoilers from here on out for those that are watching Uh, yeah (laughs) you've been warned man it's been 19 years since memento so here we go if you haven't seen it at this point then there's there's nothing wrong (laughs) So when Leonard kills Teddy, there's a moment where Joe, what's his face, uh, his the, the oh, actor, Pam Lee, I can never say his name yeah, right, Pat Deliano. He he's he's trying Leonard, and he's like you, like you, and he's trying to like trying to bring some sense to Leonard before the inevitable, and he says, "You freak, that line, you freak." If I remember correctly from the commentary of the film, that's Nolan. He said yeah, that Joe you never don't have got a it clue, right. do you? You freak. Yes. When he says you freak, that he said that Joe could never get it right, so he actually dubbed it over for himself. So if he did that, it tells me that he's always had this issue in a way with dialogue, which goes into the sound mixing too. Because my issue with this dialogue, you you reference heavy handedness. I reference heavy handedness too. Um, but not to the extent that probably it bothers uh, it bothers you that it doesn't bother me as much. Um, it, just that one really really heavy handed one in Inception that just uh, Ellen Page delivers what was sorry man that thing always like oh like I always get that way. It, it, almost all her dialogue annoys me, but in the in the case of all of his films as a whole, you could not understand a lick of what some of these characters are saying. Where it's the especially when they have British accents. So that was my issue. The first time I watched the Prestige, I walked away from that confused, not by what I just saw on screen, but because I didn't understand a thing they were exchanging. Like, what the hell are you guys saying? That's why when I watched it again, I watched it at home and I used I, I used subtitles and I, oh dude, this is good. So I, I started to learn that I'm going to need subtitles for Nolan movies because I had the same problem with Batman Begins. I'm like, dude, what is Michael Caine saying? Yeah, uh, 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 Christian Bell mumbles a lot, but Michael Caine is saying things that I do not understand a word of, especially the one that always got me. He's like, what the flip is he saying? Because I watched that four times in the theaters, and I still didn't get it until I got the DVD and put it with subtitles on it. It's the part where... Um, where uh, Bruce tells um, Alfred, uh, it was Rachel, Alfred, she was dying. She's downstairs sedated. I need you to take her home. And my uh, Alfred is taking her to the car. And there's some waiters that kind of look. Oh, yeah, oh, they're going on? He's like, oh. <laughs> like, and people in the theater started laughing. I'm like, what the hell are you guys laughing at? What do you say? Subtitles, a little was for wear, I'm afraid. Who was supposed to deduce that? that? That's an issue I have with Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell from the BBC. It, a lot of the dialogue is so snappy and fast, and you have to be all in your up and up on all those accents and dialogues with those British people to understand a lick of what they're saying. But because I read the novel, I understood. So anyway, back to this thing. That was my issue, that when you have British characters delivering dialogue, don't understand a thing. So that was the thing that I learned to us, uh, uh, that I noticed that I had issues with Nolan. That's like, dude, you have problems with dialogue slash sound mixing here. 
There's a thing you want it to sound some way, and then you have dialogue that you it's either too muted or the whispers are so high that the it just like you can't. And he clearly wants it. I mean, like as you said, he he said, "Oh no, this is intentional." Because uh, to bring it back to Tenet, so I forgot to say this. So I had a problem with it. I'd say the first, gosh, twenty to thirty minutes of Tenet, maybe in fact maybe that was a problem with me not getting into it. First twenty thirty minutes of Tenet, I was very aware of how much dialogue I was missing in the, in, in the movie. Um, I didn't miss the dialogue, but I, I think it was because of the, the sound settings in my theater, the way it was set up. But if you listen to it as it's meant to be listened to, which I would say would be like Dunkirk style where everything like, like on you, like, all right, dude, the sound's on me. I get it. I get it. I totally understand everybody missing the point, like the, the pitch meeting video. It's like, oh, here, let me put in the dialogue. Blah, 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 blah. And then all the music playing loud. It's like, what, what, what are you saying? What are you saying? And there, you turn off the music, and there's like, dude, you just explained the whole damn thing over music, and I, I didn't hear a damn thing. Yeah, that's the problem. Because in Interstellar, which is why I'm bringing it to there, is where I learned to accept it. Matthew McConaughey is mumbling almost all the time. I don't understand a thing of what he says, and you have the music playing so loud. There's no auto ducking anywhere. It's like so loud. Like, dude, what is he saying? And Nolan said that was intentional. So it took interest for me to say, okay, okay, I'll accept that this is the way you do it. So you need to work with me here. You have to include subtitles in your movies from now on. You have to. So I watched Dunkirk, and I'm glad he said, oh, this was meant to be a silent movie. Good, because if I felt like a silent movie, I didn't understand a lick of dialogue. I, I think that is a – see, I'm going to go ahead and say I think that is a failing then because if it's the director's intent to do something, you know, it could be a failing on, on the viewer that you just don't want to accept something. But you know, I find th- there's movies that you, it's very clear that the dialogue is drowned out for a reason, and – if you're astute at all, you can usually pick up on it. You go, okay, the point of this the, the scene is not what they're saying. It's about you know the camera work. Something tells you that that's not the point of the scene. If you're curious, you can put on subtitles. But like Terrence Malick, Terrence Malick loves to do that. The characters are talking. You can just kind of pick out what they're saying. But it, it's also very clear that it doesn't quite matter that you're catching every line of dialogue. You get the gist, and you know you're just supposed to be getting the gist. With the Nolan movies, I go, this seems pretty – important what they're saying I, I just don't understand why you're why you're drowning it out because to not get it, it it doesn't add to the mystery you're usually very much you want people tracking with these kind of things that you've set up very carefully how he does his act structure so i i don't get why he does it it seems to be antithetical to what he wants you to get by the end of the movie so i, I don't really understand why he does it even though i've heard his explanation yeah and like so i said yeah i agree that is nolan's fault one that I learned to accept, for which is why since Interstellar, I've been saying he needs his movies with subtitles. There's no excuse for it. And now we see Tenet, and that's his, the largest criticism towards him. And said, so, yeah, I agree. That thing needs subtitles. Uh, I did, have- did you understand? Like, um, I thought maybe it was the intent. So the, op- the opening... They're going through. They have the masks on and stuff. Like, are, are, are we spoiler free for now? Or, or are we, 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 already, for, we already gave the warning. Are, so, yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. So they're going through. They got the masks on. I thought maybe that was the point. I was like, okay, maybe it doesn't matter that I'm not understanding it. Um, but I had to say it, it, it was annoying because boy, like you're getting right in this movie, and I, I'll be lucky if I got half of what was said. Maybe it was the theater I was in. I'll be lucky if I got half of what was said in that opening. They're the running through the building. And then it continued. There's the scene where, um, uh, like, the guy's pointing the gun at him and threatening to kill him and stuff like that. The the protagonist couldn't understand dialogue there. It was a problem for a while. It, it, but it seems like it got better throughout the movie. I think that's been commented on. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, it's it's clear now? That was a huge barrier. In fact, thank you back on it now. I think that was a huge barrier for me getting into the movie. Because, you know, most people, it's about establishing a pace history. in the movie. And 30 minutes into the movie, I didn't feel like I was into it yet. And I think part of it was I kept realizing I was realizing I was focusing on I think I missed that scene. I missed what they were saying there, and it was very difficult for me to get into the rhythm um, mm-hmm. of it. So yeah. I, I didn't feel like I was in the rhythm of that movie until uh, well over the hour mark, where I felt like I was okay. I'm, I'm like with it again. So yeah. some some people would probably not be remiss if they missed the beginning, um, the the opening scene. Uh, that one I I caught just about everything they were saying. I just didn't understand the explanation of it until much later. But which, which is the point? Like, okay, what was the point? And we find out later what the point was. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that I, I wasn't catching was 
code check. But what I did get was that they were speaking in code. So that was one thing, that they were immediately speaking in code. It's like, we live in a twilight world. It's like, we live in a twilight world. And then our friends at dusk, so you've been made. I'm here to either kill you or you come with me. So that was it. That's literally all the dialogue there. And it's like, we're giving the code. It's like, all right. So then thereafter, uh, for Tenet, um, and I guess bringing it all to, to this one, uh, that's where my, my issue with Nolan um, continued because I, I caught everything. But I admitted that it was hard to catch it. But it's like the issue with Inception, almost three quarters of the movie is exposition. That's basically all Joseph Gordon Levitt's there for to carry you to explain everything, everything, everything. Yeah. And and Ellen Page is there to ask the questions for you. But yeah, what does it mean? But what does that mean? Blah, blah, blah. And for you to get insight into Leo's character, she's asking his questions to to basically flesh out his character. That's my issue, see? Everybody says that they, like, oh, the character's an inception. What characters? There was no freaking character growth if it wasn't for Ellen Page asking him. It was just him trying to get home. That's it. And even then, I'm sorry, I didn't care. It's like your emotional investment to your the issues with your wife and whatever, I'm not buying it. As great as an actor as you are, you couldn't save that connection. And I like that actress. I, I'm going to forget her name too, but she's um, done other things. She, yeah, and she's a very good actress yeah. when when she wants to be. Her her death scene in The Dark Knight Rises, notwithstanding. <laughs> but um, but no, uh, I I think I might have viewed it more favorably from you. But I still don't think the strength of Inception was the um, was the Leo wife relationship. But at least he put it into a, a couple scenes where yeah. he he gave it time. I don't know if it quite worked. It wasn't amazing for me, but at least he gave it some he, he gave he, it some time. He gave us a necessary backstory. Yeah. But that, the, there in goes my point that the emotional connection as number two that I, that I had issue with that he I lacked the emotional connection that was it and to me in, Inception was the prime example up to that point like there's no emotional investment here despite his greatest efforts like not that's why I said the, the the Dark Knight story notwithstanding because that one you connect with Bruce Wayne throughout his entire growth trying to trying to become Batman the hero. Not some masked guy that's just nuts. So you needed his growth. That's what those movies were about. It was the Batman. Okay. So with that out of the way, it was like you. He. I felt like if he had an original property, he had that struggle with the emotional connections. I, I did get the emotional connection, the memento. Absolutely. That's because it was a tour de force of acting from all their fronts. And it's my goodness. That's just that's just awesome overall. But then insomnia. Uh, I was kind of there, kind of not, even though it's a great story. Great story. Watch it again now. It's like you just let yourself go. It's like this is so good. But I'm not entirely invested in the uh, in the emotional characters, particularly Al Pacino's character, um, as, as it should be. Mostly because I'm distracted by Robin Williams every time. It's like, dude, you are creepy. <laughs> oh, man, you're creepy. He, he had uh, that, uh, kind of a Heath Ledger effect there where he overshadowed uh, the main character uh, a little bit where you're, you're, you're so drawn to his character that it almost it, it imbalances the movie a little bit because you're, you're too interested in, in trying to get back to the Robin Williams. But, you know, he operates best as only being a, a fraction of the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, in, in that movie, uh, where um, I would have bought into a little more had it been fleshed out just a little bit more, um, Al Pacino accidentally shooting his partner, and the, yeah. and the partner believes that you, did you did you shoot me on purpose? No, it was an accident. The fog. You can yeah. easily conclude it was an accident, but Al, at some point, I don't know where, I don't know where we're supposed to infer that, you know, that the Ace case. I think we'd be okay now that my friend is gone. So he's, now he's not really having an issue with the death of his friend, but we're supposed to infer it later when uh, Maura Tierney's character comes into play. He's like, yeah, I don't know if I really felt all that bad that I actually shot my friend because his death actually benefits me because I actually did him. I planted evidence on the guilty guy. We don't get that until much later. So, I mean, he, he lacked it. The prestige, uh, I, I did, um, I, I felt uh, more so than anybody else. Um, uh, Christian Bell's connection to uh, his family crisis. Absolutely. Yes. I didn't feel it with Hugh Jackman. Um, I didn't feel his obsession and passion for, for, for striving to get the biggest magic trick. 
if anything, I felt like he was trying to make a comeback from being wrong so much and being doubted. So I never felt like he was ever the ultimate antagonist. Look what you've done. It's like, wait, dude, you really gone all far fetched? I didn't really feel where did that crescendo happen in your character growth for you to become that extreme that you're willing to destroy a man's life and steal his child? I never get the conclusion, despite the fact it's still an awesome story. I love the movie. But if we're going to really nitpick because we're nitpicking Tenet, we got to nitpick all of it. Inception, I spoke about it to death. Dunkirk, that one is a different story because it's not about a character here or there. That's what Nolan was saying. This is not about an individual. This was a true story of what actually happened and the people that fought to make them all survive together in this position of impossibility. So we just happen to have some eyes on the ground or eyes on the boat or eyes in the sky to get a feel for what all this really entailed in the impossible situation that the troops found themselves with their backs against the, the waters and the enemy closing in, killing everything in its sight. So the, there's an emotional payoff to that because you know that that uh, uh, um, civilians came to the rescue, and the soldiers feeling like, man, we're coming home defeated. It's like, no, we're glad you're home. And for someone that's any history buff, would know, it's like, dude. And the next time they come back, like two years later. It's with a one million man armada led by the Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower with the D-Day invasion. So, yeah, there's a lot there historically. And that's why the movie itself, uh, despite the fact that the biggest issue besides the sound mixing was the atrocious soundtrack, the emotional payoff always hits home. It's incredibly well done. So high props to a master class in storytelling where it was an audio and visual experience. Not a dialogue experience on purpose, and that's how he explained it. So, like, okay, I'll excuse that. I still don't excuse yeah. the awful soundtrack, but it it, yeah. it nailed it. The the intent of the movie is obviously a, a major component of it. If you're watching a movie for what you think the director you know wants to do because what they've previously done, and you're not watching the movie that they're trying to present to you, then you know you're you know, obviously you're not going to enjoy it. Um, I if we're going to critique, like I, I so I love the prestige. Um, it's pretty high up on my list for for his, but really? I'll admit I think, I think that the uh, the interplay between the characters and their family um, is uneven, and I, I'm not sure if it's uneven just because Christian Bale is such a good actor. The relationship with him and his wife, not the him and Scarlett Johansson, him and his wife in that movie, the one who eventually uh, commits uh, suicide, that part of the movie is so strong for me that it overshadows some of the other um, uh, relationships a little bit. Um, I'll maybe cut a little bit of slack to the Hugh Jackman character because part of his arc is that his motivations are confused because it purposely starts out that his motivation is that he blames Christian Bale for killing his wife and that you realize halfway through the movie he's become confused. Uh, I think the Scarlett Johansson character, while they're still together, says something to him. So, what are you I don't care about my wife. It's about the tr- And that he's... You, that you're not really sure anymore. Well, what is your motive? Like, where are you? And that he's kind of gotten lost. So, I might excuse that one a little bit. I didn't quite buy the Scarlett Johansson, Christian Bale one, or certainly no, not as much well, as the other ones. No, because that's on purpose. Remember, it's two people. Yes. So that one's that's the reason I can excuse it because the one that loved the wife didn't want the affair, but the one that wanted the affair. Did not love the wife. And it's like, say it. I love you. It's like you don't mean it today. It's like some days you do, some days you don't. Some days you're more you're more in love with magic than you are with with me. And it just makes it all the better when I know when I can tell which is which. That's that's the magic of it because um, you can understand that uh, that the, the hints are there. That something is is split about Christian Bell's character. Like, Borden doesn't really seem like a whole person if he has some mental issues. Only to find out that, holy smokes, you've been two people this whole time. Like, the simplest explanation was there the whole time. Like, no, 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 the ma- it's too simple. It's the, it's the same man that comes out of the box. The prestige oh, of the it, same man. It, it got me the first time I saw it. And yeah. you literally have the character, the Hugh Jackman character, telling the answer. It, no, it can't be that simple. And you're like, that's who I was watching the movie. No, that can't be it. It's too simple. That's why it made it, it, made it all the more powerful when, uh, when you, and that's like, well, if it's the same guy, why is he still missing fingers? Oh, you're that devoted to the craft. 
dude, you're insane. Because the tape was like, I don't understand why I'm still bleeding like this so much. Like, ah, that's. Yeah, and but that, there was a difference between the two characters, and it's odd because you see it at the end when he kills Hugh Hugh Jackman. In some ways, I feel like even though the Hugh Jackman character kind of becomes the the villain at the end of the movie, I feel like he actually understood the magic better than the Christian Bale character. It, for him, it was it was almost like a like a personal like an art. It was so about that the, the craft and that he didn't really care so much about the audience it was, it was about his personal reasons for for almost like a almost like a like a samurai character about i or, or like robert de niro and he yeah. i will i'm gonna stick to the code and it's about the ethics of sticking to that whereas the huge acting character said you never got it did you it was about you know he says something like that if, you could, if you could fool him for one second, he said, you got to see something special. And you realize that that was the difference between the two, mm-hmm. that the Christian Bale character never got – and he never got that enjoyment from from his performance. That's true. That's true. And that's – yeah, I got to watch that movie again. <laughs> <laughs> the wife's been on a Nolan binge like, we got to watch Tenet. Like, sure, we just watched it, but let's watch it again. That's fine. I'm cool. We just got it in 4K. Um, this is actually our third time through it. So it's uh, – Oh, wow. Yeah, she – because she she enjoyed the movie, but she also is of that audience that didn't grasp that. And we're this last time we're watching it, we're actually uh, about a third of the way through, no, halfway through it, because we're stopping along the way, which is what I'll get to in a bit. Because I got to touch on Interstellar to jump on to to Tenet. So Interstellar was the was the film that uh, he addressed one of the two main issues that I mentioned: the sound mixing. He told me, accept it because that's the way it is. Okay, fine, I'll accept it. But had you screwed up that emotional connection that you missed out on everything, it this... Got it. Thank you, Google. It would have failed entirely. If Matthew McConaughey's love for his daughter did not translate there, the entire movie falls apart. I, I agree. Absolutely. Because that's the driving force of the film. That's why there's three moments that I, as a father, just find myself crying. I think the the, the most... Well, the two mo- most powerful parts uh, that are overshadowed by the even larger part is when he's leaving his daughter, and um, oh my goodness, the uh, video scene. No, no, that's that's the that, that, the that's messages. The, uh, the messages scene is the best. Uh, the other one is um, um, him finally seeing his daughter. Uh, that uh, it's and it's she's. She's that old. Um, there's something beautiful oh, right. in that moment. But yes, the moment where he's catching up on the memories and he's just crying, like, dude, that is that is some honest emotional expression there, man. Uh, it's like, dude, I, I buy this entirely. And then ultimately, when his daughter finally comes on, and you're still like, oh my goodness, yeah, she's on, and she's like calling, him out, you're not here, like, ah, you're feeling it, you know? It's like this is absolutely uh, gorgeous. That's for me. Uh, that's why I ranked it uh, at Nolan's. Uh, I, I, I did this with my friend Russell. Where we ranked them. I put in uh, basically our lists mirror each other before Tenet. And then his number one is, inter- is Inception. I said, knock knock your entire list down one rug and put Interstellar over the top. And I said, the difference between him and I, I said, the difference between uh, you and I in this case is that uh, I, as a father, connect even more emotionally to it because it's a father daughter story. So you kind of need that kind of background to truly connect. And since he's still uh, on the younger side, not, not, not being married or at all having an emotional connection with that story, uh, he doesn't rank it that way. And that's okay. I said, dude, that's fine because I have a, a, a deeper connection because I'm a father. So it, taking at the tenant, it has the high concept of inception with the principles of, of, uh, of theoretical physics and quantum mechanics of interstellar with uh, um, the sound mixing of both. You have the loud, loud involved music of inception and the complex exposition from interstellar drowned out by the sound so that's where tenant will fall short because you have individuals not to knock on anybody i as a as someone that grew up as english as the second language that became my first language eventually uh can attest to when you have individuals with heavy accents that probably have english as their second language delivering complicated things it's it's not driving home the point it's like okay i'm a little lost here that's so the priya character i understand her a lot more because yeah. of my second viewing. But for for the first viewing, it's like, what the hell is she saying and what is her involvement in this movie? And that's what – she she was the one that was kind of like pushing the protagonist in one which way or another. But here's where I defend Tenet. 
the pitch meeting video is the one that stood out to me because every time they cut back and forth, because he has a green screen, it was a different background. Did you see the pitch meeting one? The, I haven't. I have. You haven't. Okay, so you're gonna get it when you see it. it it's on my watch. I will definitely go watch it. <laughs> uh, but you'll see it when you get it uh, because the two characters, the like the 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 writer, uh, the pitch. The, the pitch meeting, um, the writer and the, and the executive are back and forth, and the executive's like, why do you keep changing backgrounds every time we're having a conversation? Oh, because we're going to have a conversation, and we're going to stop and change locations, and continue the conversation there. So individuals are going to have a conversation and stop completely and pick that conversation up in a completely other place, so they're going to stop for like a few hours and then carry on a conversation? Oh, yes, sir. He's like, wouldn't that be confusing? It's like, oh, yeah, but it's going to look beautiful. Here's where... If any, if anyone's just watching it for that way, then they missed it entirely, because the answer is actually at the conclusion of the movie. The conclusion of the movie. Uh, mm-hmm. This is kind of where I felt that the cinematography was a little mm-hmm. off because mm-hmm. Nolan doesn't generally do this. There's three moments where the cinematography was wanting our focus on something. The only time I ever seen Nolan force us to look at something was when Leonardo DiCaprio. He got through the, the customs checkpoint, is able to arrive home. Am I dreaming or am I not? Spinning the, the totem. Sees his kids. He's distracted. So now the camera wants you to focus on the totem. That's the only time that I can think of in all of his movies that he made us focus on something. Not so in Tenet. He was already kind of giving it to us, which kind of annoyed me. Opening scene. Yeah. The, the reverse bullet that saves, um, that saves uh, uh, John David at the very beginning. And he looks and you see some guy running away. But then the camera, for some reason, wants to be fixated on some jangling little emblem or a thing on the backpack. Like, pay attention, it's going to come back later. I'm like, okay. Unless, you, unless it's like a plot point, it had no reason for us to have our focus on it a little more. It's like, remember that. That's, that's the only thing that drew me away because he immediately got me like, dude, you already want me to pay attention to that. I don't like that. Um, and I already forgot it too, buddy. <laughs> it was the most thing I had to figure out like, talking to people later on. Like, did you catch this? And you know, between like four of us, we, we pieced the movie together. So, in the end, we realized that the Neil character that he ends up meeting this whole time is the one that puts on the backpack and turns around, and you see the little thing. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, that's the third appearance. The second appearance of it is when they uh, is when they're trying to stop the bomb from going off or the algorithm from going off and when they get there, the door is locked. They can't unlock it. And uh, Vanko, the, the henchman of the bad guy, is there basically to stall them. And before he could shoot John David, um, uh, now that we know, Neil's character jumps in, jumps in between, gets shot. He's the one that dies. Um, but apparently he's also the one that opens the opens the gate for them to unlock it but before before all that when they get to that gate there's a body already there that's already been shot and you see the backpack and it's that um i guess that little rabbit's foot that you're supposed to follow from the very beginning of the film yes there's a second appearance okay this was that one guy that saved me at the very beginning so that's the connection there so like i don't want from the very first scene for us to make that a central focus something that's going to come back later like we're going to forget it but i understand the movie was complex man that's how you could have lost it so then when it, Neil, it got a little too cute uh, i don't know if that's the right phrase a little too cute for me like see what i can do for placing uh because it, since that became like a a totemistic thing of, of his movies or at least what people expect from his movies i feel like he, mm-hmm. i feel like he feels he has to do it now and then he has to top whatever he's done previously he's kind of left himself for there's really nowhere else to go except for to become so convoluted to, to say look what i can do over you know three hours and can you can you follow this rabbit trail and that's I, I I don't like the direction where he's going overall when you start kind of tracing it back over the movies. I'm like, I think you need to get back to what you did really well and why people why people were attracted to you initially and why they wanted you to do the Batman series was you did you know these kind of complex stories, but they were always in service of the character and the little quirks were there for the story. They were not separate from the story. They were either integral to it. Um, or it assisted it in some way. It wasn't a uh, well. Here's a story, but here's a way I can jazz it up. And now it's it's interesting. But then you, you kind of go back and think about it. You go, what did that add? Or was that? It was more, like I said, more interesting than 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 necessary. And I feel like at least with 
memento through like the prestige you know we can kind of argue about the execution of it but it was clearly his intention to keep it that way and i felt like he started to lose that once he did in inception and the idea became about what is he going to come up with next and he started thinking more um he's that he started planning his movies more conceptually um whereas before it felt like it was more grounded in the in the characters themselves and things kind of grew out of that mm. Or at least that's how I kind of see his his arc in in movie making. Well, uh, the the two of the points that uh, well, I guess the what I was mentioning in, in Tenet about like the the camera focus, it's one of my favorite scenes. But I felt like the Nolan was giving it away before it even happened, and that was the the heist the, the freeway heist scene. So when they're they're getting away. Um, when they got the the box of this piece of the of the algorithm, um, the camera is kind of moves forward but to the side a bit, so you can catch a glimpse of a shattered part of the of the passenger side glass. So I'm like, you want us to notice it, or in repeated viewing we could have caught it, but that was already saying like, wait, that wasn't there before. That's gonna come into play. Pay attention and. Yeah, because the next he's like, what the hell is that? And it's the car coming in reverse. So like, huh. That was fantastic, by the way. So well done. So uh, that's what I mean. Like, I felt like this. it was a different cinematographer I could tell. Um, that's not normally what Nolan does. So it's that felt a little off of Nolan. Everything else was typical Nolan. It was his high concept of his love of, of science and, and science fiction, the theoretical possibilities and all that. So when people like in the pitch means like, well, why do these characters keep having this back and forth in the different places? Well, the answer, like I said, is at the end of the film where um, Neil is uh, is leaving. And when he turns around, the backpack shows that little token like oh, you're the one that died to uh, help, uh, like help us uh, unlock the gate to get out to like what, what's going on here. So the, the, the giveaway that Neil was saying was uh, um, this is the beginning of our friendship. This is where we start. We're going to go on a lot of adventures together. And in repeated viewings, uh, you'll start catching it. It's when they first meet, and they sit down. And he's like, I hear you in need of this and that. And John David says, uh, um, yeah, I, uh, I need this or whatever. So he's like, I'm Neil. So they shake hands. And then the waiter comes over. And, he's like, and I think he said, I'll have a martini or whatever and Diet Coke for John David. They just met. And he's like, you've done your research. And that's where they left it. That's because they've known each other for so long and they had to pretend that he didn't. The final sequence, Neil is there about two or three different times because he's, um, he's uh, um, normal time, uh, inverted, and then uh, normal after being inverted. But he's already dead and then he's trying to get to the position to be able to open the gate or whatever to let him in before he dies or he has died and stuff like that because... When they have the discussion towards the very end, like, or this never happened, we don't see each other, take it apart, bury it, whatever, we'll come kill each other later so this, so we never know who or what might have happened. We find out that the protagonist is the one that funds Tenet. He's the one that uh, um, recruits Neil. So when we they discuss what is called the grandfather paradox in the movie. The grandfather paradox. Can you go in the past and kill your grandfather and still be around? Wouldn't that def wouldn't wouldn't that be contradictory of the nature of how time works? Because you're killing your past in a way. So you, how can you ever be? So like we don't know. So with the Interstellar and Tenet both apply here because it's the scene. What like people know as the the library scene or the Tesseract scene, the library of memories, as I come to call it, for Interstellar is like he sees a little girl's room, all of her memories, all like her entire life. And it's like, she's not going to understand this complexity of everything you were trying to message to her. It's like, no, but she eventually will come back to this point. So I'm going to find that point and deliver the message. So he's communicating through time. But he's communicating in all these different layers. So it could have happened at any time. And he's like, but how do you know she's going to get it? She's going to come back for that watch eventually. So it doesn't matter if it's past, present, or future. She's going to see it. And we know it succeeded because we are here. We built this fifth dimension. We are they. We survived. 
just that we're trying to find the point that continues the continuity of humanity. Same thing with Tenet. What happened? What continued that? How did they know that 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 where things were? Because the bad guy started getting a, a, a notice on this. He's like, he started getting a hint of stuff. That's why he he kind of throws it back in one line. It, it's so easy to miss because he doesn't do the thing and says tenant. But the bad guy does say yes. But there are the, um, we live in a twilight world, and John David doesn't respond to that. He's like, oh, what is that, Whitman? It's pretty. Like I'm on to you. Is what the guy was saying. I'm on to you. Because you make no sense. You're, how, do you, how do you know so much when your background makes no sense? That's why there was a line that everybody missed because they said it on the boat. When they were like, like speed sailing, whatever the heck that was. Um, mm-hmm. where, where, uh, he's like, you don't need a partner. That, that's what the bad guy tell him, Sator tells him. And he's like, you have no background in anything that we're doing. Yeah, I'm that good. It's another word saying... You don't need to worry about anybody finding out about me. It's like, that's true. Because the bad guy couldn't figure anything out about this guy. He's like, you're that good at covering your tracks. Okay, then maybe we can talk. That's basically how he got his confidence. Because like this guy doesn't make any sense. You're supposed to be some kind of diplomat, but you're a pretty good fighter for a diplomat. And stuff like that. He just kept questioning. But like, this guy is shrouded in mystery. He's pretty good. Anyway, so the, the final moment, the entire battle sequence that's layered in, in complexity... You could say it's a convoluted uh, um, a theorem of different timelines is because it's like, how many times did we do this? Because before they go in there, they say, all right, the red team is going to go in normal. The blue team is inverted. You can't see them. We're not going to see anything that they do. They've already done it. We have the we have the benefit of their experience to go into doing what we're about to do. In other words, they've already done it. So we're going to go through the motions of what we know that they went through to figure this thing out. But Neil's character breaks the rule they all had. Do not mix one another. The reason he mixed it is because his information shows that they failed the mission. So he needed to break the rule and interact with real time. And when that didn't work, is to break is to further risk everything to make sure. That this timeline will succeed or else all fails. So that's why when they say, what, so why are these characters talking in different places? I, and this is my conclusion without doing any research. I'm not, not going to go into the forum to figure this out. This is my conclusions. And normally whatever I deride of Nolan stuff tends to be right. So I'm going to go off my, my confidence in that. Is that this mission has happened that many times. So... When this little token that the camera wants us to focus on about Neil's backpack. And Neil telling us at the very end that you, protagonist, you started Tenet and you recruited me. This is the moment where we meet. But this is where we have our adventures. And you're going to recruit me in the future. So somewhere in the future, John David realizing this, the protagonist realizing this important mission. He needed to put the things in place. He's like, okay, in this part time. So now think of Matthew McConaughey in the Library of Memories. Which positions in time do so-and-so or these pieces need to be in order to make sure that we succeed this time in saving humanity? That's why it looks the way it is. It's a complex thing because it is complex when you're dealing with quantum mechanics and theoretical physics. So that one say, oh yeah, high concept failed. Not for someone that actually enjoys this stuff. It's like, dude, this thing is found in space. Absolutely. That's why I said my only re- review of it was pure physics brilliance because that's exactly what it was it was everything was a play on physics how do you show someone fighting in 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 our real entropy fighting against somebody that has reverse entropy he displayed it awesome how do you affect or have characters deal with time like the the moment where where neil and the protagonist enter a room looking for a painting and they're like what the hell happened here it hasn't happened yet. And then someone comes out of the doors. Well, on each side. Not realizing it's the same guy. Because the event has already happened. So we're seeing one play out in reverse and one play out in real time. It's like, what the hell? Which is why it's like... With the with the grasp of the physical properties of what Nolan was, was bringing across here. It's literally leapfrogging off interstellar. So that kind of complexity, most of everybody's not going to get it. 
a lot of people didn't enjoy Interstellar. Interstellar has worse reviews than Tenet. Why? Because this is stupid. It's not possible. They're like, wait, you believe in science fiction crap, but you're gonna, you're gonna complain against Interstellar? You had astrophysicists come in and say that's as accurate as it gets to real theorem, because theoretical physics is just that. In theory, this could happen, but obviously it hasn't happened. But everything that Nolan portrayed, besides the fact that these characters were in different planets, was scientifically based. That's why some people had their minds blown. Like, you mean this could be possible? Yes, based on the theory of relativity, absolutely, this is what we expect. And the wormhole and the and the black hole, that's astrophysicist recreation of the manipulation of gravity and light. And that's as accurate as it gets, for which is why it was stunningly gorgeous. So that's all grounded in realism. Now, taking that to, like, say, the spy genre, you get Tenet. If you want to have a fun time travel movie, Back to the Future, even though it's, com- it could, it's, it's wrong. And then you have where you can have time travel that works. And then you're like, this movie is really stupid because now you can poke holes everywhere because Swiss cheese. Avengers Endgame. That movie you can enjoy on its face. And now I absolutely hate it because I watched it and I'm like, this makes absolutely no sense. Why did you have to do this stupid heist, mo- this heist thing just so you could set up that Loki's back so he can have his own Disney Plus show? Literally, that's what happened. It's like everything is stupid. All you had to do was go back seven months instead of 10 years or whatever it was to get the stones back. But instead, it's like, no, let's go back to different timelines and risk changing those realities so we can save our reality and then go back and put those stones in place to save that reality. See, the thing is, if you really, really, really want to think about how stupid that is, this is how it goes. Captain America takes everything back at the very end. But doesn't come back. He gets married. Has a life. Didn't he just change the lives of everyone else that the original Peggy married? She married someone else and had kids. How do we know that? Because her niece kisses Captain America in Civil War. Whoopsie. So that's why Tenet, in its complexity, people say, this doesn't make sense. This stupid. It's convoluted. It, it works because that he structured it in that way. If you want entertainment, you can poke fun. You could take the same the same complaints that people have about Tenet, but you can't poke holes at it because, because well, I don't get it, but that's why I don't like it. But it's like, I like it, but man, that's actually really stupid. Like, you start seeing what happened, which, where I say, if you're going to tackle a, a topic of time travel and you want to do it right, or time manipulation or time warping, you have to do it right. That's why Nolan said, this is not a time travel movie. But it is a play on time itself. And I'll, I'll, this is my last point for which I'll, I'll yield to you. When I saw the, t- the trailer for Tenet, because nobody knew what the heck this movie was about. When I saw the trailer for Tenet, the trailer was just this. It was a trailer of, of uh, John David walking into a room where there, was, uh, where there were holes on, on the glass. And it's like, okay, what is that? And then Neil asked, what happened here? It hasn't happened yet. Okay, that was it basically. So what do we infer from that? N- for most people, nothing. So my friends and I discussed it. It's like, what do you think this movie is about? Oh, it's a movie that takes place simultaneously past, present, and future. And we're going to be seeing the movie in the, pre- in the present. In other words, the consciousness of the protagonist will be traveling from the past and the, and the future. That's the, that's the POV of the movie. That's what I immediately inferred from the trailer. Immediately. And that's exactly what the movie was. So, it, it, I guess to say, I'm not a Nolan worshiper, but it is something to say that I've, I study the guy enough to understand where he's going. For which is why I called out The Dark Knight. I described the entire plot before it came out. The Dark Knight Rises, I called it everything for what it was. Interstellar, same thing. Dunkirk, same thing. So when this one's like, same thing. So every single movie that's come out since Inception, I have called it all out. So... I feel I have a pretty good gauge about Nolan. I have recorded, uh, whether it's in writings on my blogs or previous podcasts, I have records to show and prove that, yes, I called this thing out. So it's not just me, like, in hindsight, calling, see, I told you. No, I have said it from before, for which is why this doesn't surprise me. And also, the audience reaction doesn't surprise me. 
Because the same reaction that people had a tenant that they had to interstellar. High concept, they didn't get it. But when you take the same principles and stupefy it for like Endgame, uh, Avengers Endgame, or some other hot tub time machine or whatever, they'll accept it because it's entertaining. So this was high concept meant to entertain. Some people were too caught up on the high concept and wanted something different. I got exactly what I expected. A Nolan theorem. And I enjoyed it for what it was. Oh, you were going to interject some somewhere earlier, so I thought I cut off the point. I, I, I was like, you're uh, you're riding the wave there. I was <laughs> making sure <laughs> making sure you're finished. <laughs> yeah. That, so I'll, I'll say what uh, I'll say what my favorite thing about the movie was because you you touched on it. So the Robert Pattinson character, um, I thought that relationship worked really well because it it did tip it off. At least for me, it tipped it off. I remember thinking this in in the theater. I went, the two of you know each other. And it wasn't because of any gimmicky thing. It was because of how Robert Pattinson played it, and not just that scene with the coke. Uh, he clearly played it like that. He knew him. I was just like, he's and it, because it's it's in the context of that movie. I was like, you know, in another movie, you where you might have been like, why is this guy acting like they've been friends for for years mm-hmm. when they just? But I was like, I was like, okay, but the protagonist didn't play it that way. So I thought that worked really well. I said the, the two of them worked well because I was like, when it got to the end and you go, you're like, okay, good. That played out the entire movie. Robert Pattinson played it like someone who could not help but avoid that he had known the guy for a long, long time and that they were friends and played it that way. But uh, John David's character, the protagonist, didn't play it that way necessarily. It took a kind of throughout the movie and there were still points where he would come up and say things that the, I don't know you well enough to necessarily trust you. You know, that came up a couple of times. So how, how that played out in the timeline of the movie of, of how time works, that worked really well for me. In fact, that, that was, that was the best part of the movie for me was the two of, of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need a side where, movie of just them and their adventures. <laughs> I, you know, uh, quite honestly, if if the universe of that movie had been more about the probably just the the two of them, I think I might have had a slightly different impression coming out of it. Um, when it went back to Kenneth Branagh and the wife, I just uh, you know. I, I, I can see how everything tied together and all that. It just uh, I lost a little bit of interest every time it kind of segued to her and in, 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 in him. First, it just uh, that it didn't play out quite right for me. Um, the protagonist and her, some of that didn't quite work for me. Even though I see the essential, you know, kind of aspect of, of how it works when when you're looking back at the timeline. Of, oh, okay. Once you get to the very end, things make sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the problem is that even when things kind of made sense, I went, okay, I get it now, or it makes sense, it still mm, just doesn't quite work for me. Uh, I suppose it's kind of like a lot of things with, with some of other Nolan's movies where certain aspects of it are simply more interesting than, than the others. And for me, the uh, Robert Pattinson, um, John David, or the protagonist, that worked so well for me that anytime it segued away from that, I was less interested in the um, in, in in the movie. I, I, I realized so, like I said, because it took a while to get the two of them to kind of pair up. So there was like the beginning with I couldn't understand the di- <laughs> I couldn't understand the dialogue, and I was like doing mental gymnastics, sitting there in the theater, going, "Am, am I tracking this correctly?" So um, and, and and that's that's another point. I will have to see how I feel about it on a second viewing because I also realized that in the first thirty minutes that I was also missing stuff on top of it. Once you realize you've missed something, and then you're thinking about, did you get something? Then you're not fully in the scene that you're watching, mm-hmm. you know, either. So, like I said, I, I felt like it was like 45 minutes into the movie, really, before I felt like, okay, I'm just in, I'm in the movie now. Um, so I am interested to see if I if I feel any different um, going back um, and just being able to just kind of watch it and not be so detached and, and be thinking um, so heavily during during each of the scenes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess just between, like I said, it, it's a weird feeling. So when I got done with the movie, I felt like I, you know, I, I felt like you and I have different opinions of the movie. But uh, but if I'm being honest too, 
uh, I was both like really excited and disappointed by it, and it, it, it's a weird thing. Like I was disappointed for some of the reasons I talked about. Yet my genuine reaction when I was done with it was I was like super excited, and there were a couple of us that were talking like, "Oh, do you think this? Do you think that?" And we were like going back and forth. So it was kind of a confusing uh, movie for me in that I realized that I didn't quite enjoy it as as much as some others, and that there were, like I said, the dialogue, some of the some of the side stories, and yet at the same time. I, I never got bored with it. I never felt like it was just a gimmick. I was clearly interested in figuring it out. And not every movie, just because it has an interesting premise, keeps you interested. If if something else isn't there, you'll you'll lose interest in, in you know halfway through it and go, yeah, I don't know, I lost interest in it, and I didn't care what the how the plot points connected at the end. So clearly that was that was in place, um, and it was there. So yeah, it was. It reminded me of Interstellar. I, I have slightly the same opinion of interstellar i had the same problems with interstellar i have trouble with like the first half an hour of the movie where they're or is it longer where they're on earth um before they kind of get to outer space i had problems with that i had problems with some of the the the, the dialogue i, I kind of felt no one was like reaching a little hard to go for the this is our generation's 2001 a space odyssey <laughs> um a, 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 a little bit like yeah see that's the thing you have to judge a film by what it says and you know, in some ways, no one invites criticism because he makes his movies very clear to you. This is a I'm swinging for the fence. It's like when Interstellar came out and you watch it, it's the it's it's like we've seen Apocalypse Now. It's it, it you know the filmmaker saying I'm going for a home run. This is meant to be the epic movie, and therefore you have to kind of judge the movie by that. You can't just kind of go, oh yeah, that was like super interesting. I really liked it because you know the filmmaker wants you to to say, oh no, this is meant to be an all time great epic and huge you know big accent kind of marks uh with it um i still haven't seen interstellar again oddly enough i i, I meant to that was another one i meant to watch again because i just went i wonder if i'll feel differently if i watch it uh, uh a second time because I, I had the same feeling as as tenet where i went the things i liked about the movie i like so much that it makes the things that i didn't like Disappointing. Instead of being able to kind of go, oh, maybe there are a few things I, I, I didn't quite like, um, but it didn't bother me, that there's like this stark contrast between the two, and it irritates you. And I, I finally realized it when I was watching Interstellar. I was like, I think I'm irritated that I liked the movie and I didn't love it. Like, it was one of those, I got to the end, I went, why don't I love this movie? This is the kind of movie I should, this should be in my top 20 of like all time. And it was kind of confusing, like, so why don't I like it that much? And Tenet was kind of the same thing. It was the type of movie that I go, that I know that I, I tend to like those movies, and it's Christopher Nolan. And I got done, I went, but I don't like it that much. Why don't I like it that much? And there's a disappointment when uh, you feel like you, you thought it was going to be here, and it's here, and here is still really is still pretty good, even though my criticism, like I said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it despite my criticisms, but I think there's some disappointment that it wasn't up here for mm-hmm. me. I, I, I suppose that's it. So I will... I will watch it again because, like I said, one of the one of the biggest problems was the fact establishing the rhythm. And I, I guess I'm about to get to where you are with him and the dialogue. It just it annoys the heck out of me because I see absolutely no reason for him doing it. It doesn't help what he's trying to do by masking by masking the dialogue. You know, if 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 it was a scene where the imagery or the cinematography was telling the story, and you're like, well, of course I'm masking it because I want you to be focusing on the image. But the dialogue in his movies is always extremely important to being able to connect all the plot yeah. points. So I just go, you know, but he, he has weird eccentricities like that. Like when he re-released 2001 A Space Odyssey and he refused to restore it and like he said, no, the only way to watch 2001 is to have the same pure experience that I had when I watched it. And then he released this um, kind of unrestored um, print when, when, when it went out and it had like, you know, marks and cuts on it and everyone else just went like, you know, I, I appreciate your love of, you know, like, you know, analog filmmaking and not digital and stuff like that. But do you really think Stanley Kubrick would want everyone to see his film in this condition and not be fully restored and remastered and that he w- that he wouldn't a guy who was a technological innovator wouldn't want like a new 4K, you know, scan of, of his film. So he has some his own kind of strange I feel like views on filmmaking and he's kind of stubborn. Like like a lot of kind of artists he's stubborn and I feel like the sound thing is something that he's gotten stubborn about and it's yeah. about that people don't understand what I'm doing and that 
I'm almost afraid that he's going to try to make a, a point with his future films to make sure that you really noticed it. And that, oh, no, I didn't get rid of it, despite your criticisms. It's going to be there. Now, so. if, if we didn't have the current situation we find ourselves in, I, I think this would have been the tipping point where the, the audience would have been like, yo, either put subtitles or you got to get better at sound mixing here. But because now maybe we don't have theaters anymore, we don't know. With at home viewing, you could turn on the subtitles, you can draw yeah. your own sound, so we don't get the Nolan experience, we get to control the experience in a way, then he might remain stubborn. So that's one thing that I, I, I wanted to say that this could have been that point where, like, dude, now you gotta address this. We're like, I don't think he's gonna be able to address this. Because we're not we're not giving him a chance to. <laughs> if anything, no. he, came out, he came out against HBO Max, and and also watching his films, um, I just realized this uh, since I'm talking about rewatching it. Um, rewatching his his film now is not going to be the same experience because talk about other Nolan you know specific things. He's huge on the shifting aspect ratio thing, so I realize it's going to be different than when I watched it uh, in in the theater. Because one of the things I read about. Tenet um, is that you know when you're watching at home is that the aspect ratio shifts quite a bit. In fact, that, that was another criticism some people had when it got released. They went um, compared to other movies, it shifts a lot during some of the scenes in the movie where there's a lot of back and a lot of back and forth. Um, and sometimes it's annoyed me. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, with say like the dark night and other things you know the imax sequences are, are usually spaced out far enough that you kind of go oh okay this is an imax sequence and it goes back to the to the widescreen format but going back and forth uh, I, I find that to be distracting and that's yeah. another thing that he's really stuck on that he he likes to that he likes to have that so i'm, I'm going to see how i feel about that because I, I read a couple reviews already that said there's some scenes where if it, it flips back and forth to to the point that it was distracting to some people watching in, it at home. In Tenet? Yes. Uh, probably if they saw that version. I got the 4K. Um, so far, I haven't noticed it on that one. It actually fills out the entire mm. screen, which I found pretty cool. And before okay. that, widescreen is just that. It's just widescreen. So, yeah. um, just to, to actually touch on uh, one of the strengths that's heavily overlooked, and it's this is to the credit of John David's uh, um, acting, um, this was a very physical role. When you see it yes. again, it was a very physical role. And uh, John David was a football player. I didn't know that. So it's like this dude, it. this dude had a physical athletic background. I'm like, dude, no wonder you pulled off what you pulled off. Because that restaurant fight scene, as brief as it is, is just outstanding. It's well choreographed. And the dude really looks like he's beating up on these guys. Yes. Holy <laughs> smokes, man. And it it's believable the dude can hold his own. So like, I like that. Oh, the protagonist is a one-note character. No, he's not. He actually has two two points where he compromises on his mission, and uh, it's what well, one point where he compromises on the mission, and the other one where he comes to realize that holy smokes, my friend's gonna die for me. This guy's been my friend longer than usual. That's that's the second one. The first one was where he puts himself in a position to risk the entire mission to save the woman that he used as a as a means to get to the bad guy. She's just another stepping stone to get to the bad guy. He lied to her, used her, and it's like, look, I, your thing is your thing. Here's a gun to protect yourself. Just don't use it on anyone. That's basically what he ends up doing. But it's she was really never his consequence because they're all going to die. She is not greater than all of humanity until he shoot, uh, uh, the bad guy shoots her with an inverse bullet and realizes, ah, oh, crap, she's going to die. And now this is on me. That's when he's like, all right, we don't have time for this. Like, screw it. I'm going to do it. What are you doing? I'm going to go back in time. Like, go, go, just, just go back. So that's where you could say he has a crisis of, crisis of conscience where he's putting at risk the entire mission. For which is why I believe that, that affected Neil's position. Because Neil will ultimately have to die because of the choice that John David made in that position. So that's me inferring all that from just two viewings the first one was in the theater and the second one was at home um and i t immediately took it because like, it wasn't that hard to deduce like that could be i'm not saying it is but it definitely could be so that's what i mean um uh, his movies do tend to take more than one sitting that is not batman movies um but it's 
it, the the criticisms I think will subside if if people actually give it its due and if they were able to understand the film, uh, like with with subtitles. But uh, a part of me did feel that uh, uh, it might have been sabotage to discourage people from going to the theater because the no one no one should be getting out of their house. And Warner Brothers might have been in that favor because they didn't want to release it in the theater. They wanted to put it on HBO Max. And no one said, no, no, no. This is going to go to the theater, which is why a lot was riding on that hope. So when HBO, when Warner Brothers announced about a month ago, hey, we're going to simultaneously release Wonder Woman 1984 in the theaters and on HBO Max simultaneously, that's it. Theaters are dead. The- I, I, I saw that uh, coming. It was... Um, it- I can't remember now. You have to help me here. What, what what's the Disney movie that Disney put uh, straight to their uh, Mulan? Mulan. So when that came out, there was some discussion uh, on some different YouTube channels. I saw they're like, "Is this the end of movie theaters?" And it was it basically came down to pure economic sense. They went, you know, Disney owns the you know owns the rights. They're releasing their own content, and I think it was, I think it was thirty dollars. I might be wrong on that. I, was thinking, exactly. I think it was, it was thirty dollars to 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 buy, and and the idea is that you know, also Disney realized how many how many buys they got. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous how many people bought it, and you start to think, well, all these people have, have been investing for more and more years and years, you know, getting five point one surround sound in their home. Sixty five inch TVs are now practically almost like the minimum. Like you know, it used to be fifty five, and I feel like people go to minimum sixty five. You're pretty well set up. All of a sudden, you think about hmm. I could spend thirty dollars, you know, especially post COVID. Spend thirty dollars. I'll have some people come over. We'll all sit in my living room. We don't have to go to the movie theater. We don't have to go spend the money on popcorn. It doesn't have to turn into a two hundred dollar night. Spend thirty dollars. It's like a UFC fight. You split it amongst your friends and your and your relatives. You sit down. You watch it, and Disney gets pure profit. They're not going to split it with the with the theater companies. And I think the light bulb went off. They went. I think they, they kind of saw that whole image of where people have been going, what they like to do, kind of economic sense of it, and just like uh, I think in every other venue, in music and movies, people are willing to put off. And you look at like streaming services, and you know where people, where especially where music went from the '90s to 2000s, people are willing to put off quality for convenience. But now, really, the quality gap. Is not as large as, as it used to be. People don't have you know a 32 inch you know uh, screen TV at home. They really have like what are you missing? Well, I have a pretty good setup at home. I've got a big screen TV, 4K HDR. Got my 5.1 surround sound setup. I got Dolby Atmos. I have speakers in in, in the ceiling now, and it's going to bounce off. Um, yeah, I don't have to go out to the theater. I don't have to pay for the overpriced popcorn. You know, to, as a as a moviegoer, it would be extremely unfortunate to me. I feel like people would be missing out um, on on the experience of that. But I think even I have to admit that there are there are certain types of movies that I would see that I don't feel that I would be missing out if I didn't see them in a theater. Say like I don't know, maybe dialogue heavy dramas or something mm-hmm. like that. That I go, you know what? I could see that streaming at home. Maybe call someone over, split the price. You know, not wait for it to, you know, just buy it, you know, pay buy my $30 ticket and watch it and not feel like I, I missed out. And that theaters will be reserved for these marquee movies, you know, like Avengers Endgame. You know, Avengers Endgame is coming out. It's an event movie. You're going to go to the theater to see to see that. But you're not going to go to the theater to see, I don't know, the 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 little family, you know, drama like my what's that movie that like my. Greek friends wedding or, or something like that, uh, you know, some some uh, my, my big, big Greek, Greek I can't remember the title, but you know, some like little family drama like that. You're not going to go out to, to the theater to see that, and the theaters will be they'll be like one or two reserved. They'll be in the big cities, and they'll be reserved for these kind of big item movies. Like you go, oh my gosh, they're like I said, Avengers Endgame, something that everyone's waiting for. And unfortunately, I, I, I do see that kind of going the way, and I don't see people fighting for it either. I see people actually being okay with that. So. Yeah, I, I think this probably will signal probably the end of movie theater experiences as, as we know it, probably over the next year or two. Probably, but then there was that problem last year with uh, HBO Game of Thrones fans that uh, ten, oh, year, the... 10 year build up to the giant battle and you couldn't see a thing. 
Uh, yeah. what, what would they call that? The long, the long night or the long, the long whatever night, that episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say the long darkness because there was nothing to see there. <laughs> and then would HBO say, "Oh, that wasn't our problem. It was your problem for not having a 4K TV." Like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's a there's a little bit of truth to that. That you know, obviously, uh, certain you know, you need dark scenes are obviously played much better on you know certain types of TVs, but. If the cinematography is done right, it should not look that bad on, on an average person's uh, TV. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, like I said, we'll, we'll end up seeing we'll end up seeing what ultimately happens there. But overall, uh, Tenet is a is a movie worth giving a second chance to, particularly because people have the control in their hands at home now, whereas before. And I think people. I, I said I'll have to see what I feel. I think there will be those of us that enjoy it more actually watching it at at home. Um, in terms of just, I said, you can turn the subtitles on if you really need to pause it for, for, for a second to not kind of lose. Like you need to think about something, make sure you're still tracking. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am interested to see uh, how how my experience differs. Like I said, watching it um, at home where I can just kind of uh, focus on it. Because like I said, it, it's hard to underestimate the problem that the, the dialogue had on me. I was really aware of it like 20 some minutes into the film and I was annoyed already. And that's obviously not good when you're 25 minutes in and you're, and you're slightly annoyed and you're aware that you're annoyed that you feel like you've, you've missed stuff that you should have gotten. Uh, obviously that affects your, you know, how, how you feel at the, at the end of it. So, um, I'm, I'm definitely willing to give it that, but I'm also not going to let Nolan completely off the hook on that. That, oh, that is on him, man. <laughs> it is on him. I just kind of gave up when he wasn't listening. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll accept that. That's what you do. Uh, but uh, it's it's interesting that, that um, I just I didn't put two and two together until just now that there is a director who I I did not enjoy his movies in the theater I enjoyed it better at home Ridley Scott I fell asleep during Gladiator uh, Oh gosh during yeah. Gladiator Yeah that's that's partly because uh, uh, friends, I guess that friends, answers the question Are you not me... entertained Andre <laughs> Segovia was not entertained in my, the theater. My, my friends gave me the play by play of every single scene and dialogue of the entire movie after the battle. The only thing that didn't spoil was the was the climatic finale of the the duel between the Emperor and Maximus. That's the only thing I didn't know about. So I'm like, oh okay. But yeah, I fell asleep in that movie. Um, the other movie I did not enjoy. I, I don't know if I told you this. Uh, I did not enjoy Black Hawk Down in the theater. I, I didn't. I thought it was oh, Ash. But when I when I saw those two movies on the second viewing at home sometime later, I'm like, well, these movies are really really good. So to keep on the trend of my issues, really, Scott, uh, Kingdom of Heaven. That's because the theatrical version sucked. Um, I had yeah, a director's cut. Yeah, and that surprised uh, me about Black Hawk Down, though. If anything, it seems like that's such a I don't know what I consider a theater specific movie. Just because yeah, that angle the you know. see him. Yeah, but I, I don't. Well, the, the gladiator because the, the whole story was spoiled for me, and I'm like, okay, I'm not really interested. Oh, this is where that happens. This is where that happens. And I fell asleep. Whereas Black Hawk Down, like I, I, I don't, I don't know what detracted me from the film, because uh, I definitely enjoyed We Were Soldiers considerably more um, thereafter. But then when I was able to give the Black Hawk Down a second viewing, um, in a better context, I'm like, dude. This movie's so so good. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Might have been the music. I was annoyed at the time. I was very strict on what kind of soundtracks I wanted to hear in my movies. <laughs> so that could have been a, a, a knock on Black Hawk Down. But now it's like, no, that's a the experimental soundtrack yeah. works for it. So it's, it's I, like, I realize we didn't talk about that. Um, I, I think that was a maybe uh, that was a knock maybe on, on Tenet that kept me out of it because I'm I'm like you. I'm very. Uh, in tune with with the soundtrack, the soundtrack is a huge thing for me. I realize in almost all of my favorite movies, um, I'm, I'm rather passionate about the soundtrack or the, or the musical score that's used in them. And I got done with Tenet. I don't think I could have pulled out anything that really stuck out to me about it. And there's some musical scores that Nolan has used that I've been huge fans of. So, like I said, it's another one of those things. I'll, I'm going to pay attention to it. When I when I rewatch it, like, did, did you love the Tenet soundtrack? There are some great moments in that soundtrack, particularly because uh, I, I it didn't feel like a different composer, even though it was because Hans Zimmer was on another project. So this is the first non Hans Zimmer soundtrack that uh, Nolan has used since The Prestige. So I'm like, this sounds going to be different. No, it sounded quite a bit like a Hans Zimmer slash Dark Knight thing because there was some Joker vibe in it, but. Um, there were some excellent moments that I think hearken to Inception. That would be 
um, the the musical cue when they're gonna they crash the seven forty seven and the cue is called seven forty seven. Um, the other the other cue was uh, um, the the heist scene on the freeway. That was pretty good. And the expected countdown uh, sequence, because if we're running out of time, that means we're going to have a song that's kind of playing to running out of time. And that the song is called, uh, um, I think it's called The Protagonist. It's like an 11 minute cue that counts down uh, for the final sequence when uh, he and, and, uh, and the, the lady cat, uh, they're, they're in the inverted machine and Neil's gone. It's like, where's Neil? It's like, oh, he's probably gone through already. And the clock starts there and it just starts crescendoing to the climax, which I thought was, uh, was really serviceable. But, um, th- when I heard some cues on it, it's like, wait a minute, this thing has sound design in it that, that plays into the movie. There is a sound design that, I thought was part of the film, but it's actually part of the soundtrack for the villain, where um, it's kind of tipping off a little bit that uh, this guy is 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 kind of either in part of the future or he's on to the future and putting it into the present where they are now, and it's like a a respiratory sound, like a struggling respiratory sound. That that was actually part of the soundtrack. At least it's either part of the movie and a soundtrack at the same time, but. On its own, I think it's part of the soundtrack that was done on purpose that was put into that. Now, here's the really trippy part. There's two versions of the soundtrack. You kind of see where this is going. <laughs> Forward, you can play it backwards too. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You can find it on YouTube. Um, the official releases. You can hear it any way you want. So it's like, whoa. Huh. This is a soundtrack in reverse, huh? So that should be interesting because I think there was a pattern that Ludwig uh, did uh, on purpose there. So there, there was some... Uh, so musical cues and they, they kind of get earworm they stay stuck in there it's like okay you got me here because I didn't think I was going to enjoy the soundtrack at all because it's, it's not my style but it definitely fit for, for what it was doing but that's the problem think of an action packed Inception like the the main fanfare of Inception constantly that's why it drowns out the dialogue it's like yeah I know it sounds cool but we don't need Travis Scott eventually shouting at us so it's funny because you weren't a huge fan. Maybe I'm getting this wrong of some of the Interstellar soundtrack. Because I actually oh, no, that it, didn't you have a problem with the um, uh, the organ or something they no, used? You weren't no, a fan no, of that, no. or am I getting that wrong? No, you're getting it wrong. I think that's uh, oh. Hans Zimmer's best soundtrack since the Thin Red Line. That one's absolutely oh. gorgeous. I must be confusing it with something else you said. For some reason, I, I, I'd always thought no. that you'd said that you you had an issue with um, Dunkirk. How, how... That's the one I had. Issue oh, okay. With. Maybe I'm confusing it with that. Yeah. No, but yeah, so I, I think the, the movie on the whole works. Um, and I think when people give it a, a, a proper viewing with their own equipment, they're, I think they're going to enjoy it a lot more. Um, the sound mixing really hurt the movie, just as it tends to do for Nolan movies. Uh, but uh, with in this case, Inception, heavy on the exposition. Uh, Tenet, one can argue the whole thing is exposition, but it's not because they say the concepts were not explained. The the mission was not the concepts of what is playing into or factoring into the, the the film, which I was fine with. If if I had one uh, criticism of Inception, and I said Inception works for me, I, it's one of those movies that um, I can acknowledge a lot of its flaws. And you know, like a lot of movies, when you like what you like, it, their stuff drowns out. Whatever Inception just kind of works for me. Uh, but um, I didn't like the fact I, I was aware more in retrospect that I was like gosh they really had to have characters explain a lot throughout the movie and I don't I don't like that and I understand every filmmaker has that has that dilemma whether you're doing stuff with with time or it's a medical movie or a military movie and you go people aren't going to understand this uh, I hate this in uh, movies about like economics or or stockbrokers um, there's always a scene where a character pretends to be amazed by, by someone explaining something to them that someone in their position would have learned like going through college and they have to pretend like they're just like blown away by it like well, if you do this then the price will go up my gosh you're amazing you're tiny it's like something like uh there was a i don't know if you ever saw the movie uh margin call no uh don't watch it then i, look, <laughs> it, I didn't it, see it, the it, entire movie it, at least not part it, of it. it has kevin spacey in it but um it's the single worst movie i've ever seen for this principle the movie is absolutely filled. It's also like they, they decided one thing that we're going to pretend every character in this movie knows absolutely nothing about economics. So it's filled with characters constantly telling other characters, 
pretend that I don't know anything about economics and explain it to me. You have like CEOs of companies saying, explain this as you would to a small child or a dog. But they do it like scene after scene, like Kevin Spacey's character constantly throughout the movie. He's supposed to be like, you know, a senior like in, in the company and he does nothing but the, you know, I hate the technical mumbo jumbo. Just give it to me in plain English. And he, he says it like five or six times. Like I've never seen a movie pull that card that many times and not trust the audience to understand mm-hmm. a single thing. So, no. So if there's anything, that's a point in favor of Tenet because I get so sick of uh, filmmakers going, okay, we have to explain. It just drags down the movie. I get like a little bit, you know, sometimes you, you just you have to put something in. But, um, yeah. So I was happy that, that he did that. <laughs> I, I, that. That was a point in favor of the movie. I was like, just just let it, let it play. Um, I was almost like – I was, I was glad that they kept the grandfather paradox conversation kind of kind of short. It's like you snuck it in there, you talk about, about it, it, and then and then oh, move on. Talk about it, damn it, debate. Yeah, it. <laughs> I, I almost would have been fine if they if they never would have said it, or if they would have done something that just like implied it. But at least they they said it quickly, and then they moved on. Mm-hmm. So I was I was okay with that. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot. There was no scene where the characters just sat down to really like let's. T- I know we're in the middle of this big chase, but let's talk about the concept of oh, time yeah. travel and like hand it to. The- so I was I was happy about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the pace just kind of kept kind of kept moving because those characters would never have just in the middle of that sat down to um, let's let's grab a cup of Earl Grey and let's talk yeah. about uh, the nature of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, you give it a second, a second viewing, uh, but I will. It, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see to to enjoy something of that kind of complexity where technically you need the exposition. Uh, I think I told you about this one because in the in that movie, um, Primer, which is a complex movie in of it itself. I love that movie. So now take I love Primer. So take Primer, turn it into an anime, stretch it over 26 episodes, and talk about possibilities. And uh, choices and moral dilemmas that are that that are occur because of that. Steins Gate, not Steins Gate Zero. Steins Gate is the absolute. It's a master class in in theoretical physics and quantum mechanics, time travel, and parallel universes. But it's it's grounded. That's what makes it so impressive. In an anime that could do anything it wants with it, but it's grounded as possible. And uh, some people have a bit of the first two episodes kind of a slow burn. Nope, because once it gets you, you are hooked. And then once it really gets going, it's like, okay, uh, you're, 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 you're getting at me here. Especially when a character that made a decision that's altered the course of, of, of his reality. It's like, okay, so how do I go back to where it was? I got to be very careful in retracing my steps. So it's, it's a gorgeous thing, especially when you've... When the characters are forgetting why they attempted to get there in the first place, <laughs> so it's like, dude, this is so good. So it's really good because towards the towards the very end, um, it feels on DVD or whatever. Um, you actually have a choice for the finale. You can, all right, the characters make a decision, this decision or that decision. So which ending do you want? So like, oh, dude, this just is like those good. books I loved as a kid. You get to pick, you yeah. get to pick your own ending. Yeah, so you you get to pick your own ending, and that's what's awesome. There is the particular ending for the story and it continues on in some extra episodes that they didn't make the show but they, they concluded with the film so they to, to telling you this is the story that we chose to go with but here's the alternate should he have given the other choice what would have happened so it's a gorgeous thing man um it's, it's that's an absolutely gorgeous thing and uh after watching tenet i'm like oh i gotta watch steins gate again every time i see anything touching on that i'm like steins gate it has to be steins gate and you have to watch it the japanese subtitles i mean the japanese with the subtitles because the the performance is there it, it, it right. really drives home the emotion oh man and the music well, if you beautiful. like primer uh or if, uh, if it's like that i'll i'll definitely give it a i'll give it a shot Primer did the very thing we were just talking about. They they made the decision in their pre-production. They went, are we going to explain this to the audience? And they went, no, they'll, they'll figure it out. And there's just heavy extended periods of dialogue where they're just going back and forth, just talking about like the construction of it and talking about things. And it's pure technical jargon. Yeah. And it, But I don't see I, – I think it proves the principle. I was like, even if you know you're not getting all of it, you get it. Because if you do the tone shifts in the conversation correctly, the ebb and flow – You'll still get what they're talking about, so you can do dialogue that you know. There's some people that aren't going to track all this, but if you do it right, you can get the end of the conversation. Go, I still know what they meant. It won't, uh, it won't lose you. 
And they also don't have any real scenes in that movie where they sit down to actually really talk about the nature of things. They allude to things like, oh, oh mate, aren't we doing this? But there's no scene that, like, the writer goes, we need a scene where they discuss the philosophical implications. It's just, it's naturally kind of, you know, interweaved where characters, they'll get angry. They're like, well, then what, is, what does this mean? And But it's just like a throwaway. It's not segue to a, to a monologue or something like that. Uh, I, I think that's one. Of, I feel like that's the template that other people should use on, on how to do those movies. Just trust the audience and worry about the blocking and the structure of, of, of the scene, and people will figure it out still. Instead, they put so much into making sure that the dialogue is right, and then you ruin it because then you give the, the, the actor dialogue – they have trouble working with and it makes it harder to cut the scene back and forth once you stick them with this unnatural you know dialogue or monologue mm-hmm. and that kind of also goes to that point of a uh, of tenet because in that movie the protagonist had to avoid their past selves when they were trying to correct things so they're basically their past and uh, the, the, their their current and future were in I guess the the past and the future were present at the same time. It's like okay, careful with manipulation. We cannot expose ourselves to that. It's like they look at each other through the binoculars. All right, there I am. There I'm going. Is it or talking through and recreate? Are we going to recreate this? We hear where this earpiece and we'll walk you through it just as it happened. It's like yeah, that's Tenet. That, 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 that's literally the final scene. It's like okay, how many times did you guys attempt this? Because it's all all the breadcrumbs are there for anyone that's followed something like Primer. And it's like, okay, how many times did they fail? In that case, they, they got it. It's like, okay, we, we're going to get it this time. And in the tenant, we're alluded to that they tried this many times. And the only conclusion to make it work out was, Neil, you got to die. So that's the- yeah, and, and I said that was good because that's the problem they run into in Primer because they try to re- uh, reconstruct the things over and over. And one of them is um, the guy goes up and asks – he invites the guy to a party, but he shoots a basketball. And in, the, in real time, you see that he makes it. And, of course, in subsequent – you know, uh, when he revisits the scene, sometimes he makes the shot, sometimes he doesn't make the shot when he goes, um, and, it, and it changes the dynamics of the how the scene plays. Like when he doesn't make it, the guy makes a comment, I think about it, and that he has to still try to get the dialogue in there. The oh, hey, you should come over tonight, and just seeing how you're still you're you know you, you can't perfectly replicate it, and you're still but you're trying to get it to go you know one one way to still recreate the outcome of the event that you that you want like i, I, I think primer was the guy had to go to the party because that's where he confronts the guy that was like angry at his girlfriend it was something like that mm-hmm. and the guy had to get to that party yeah and that, that's where it um, um i guess it all culminates in uh it's not mentioned in primer it's not mentioned in tenant but it's an understood you for anybody that studied these things it's all the butterfly effect it's yeah. literally all it it's like if you don't do this right you're gonna keep changing things so yeah uh Steins Gate doesn't do that though. They don't touch. They don't really touch on the butterfly effect like that, because the character's consciousness is in the, is traveling uh, forward in time. So he's got to that point. It's like, okay, how do I undo things? And trying to un and trying to recreate things. He's stuck in the loop. So if he's stuck in the loop, it's like this is not working. The the end result continues to happen. So what do I do? The only way you know how undo in order from the point where you were to go back and undo it all and you have to be careful in how you undo it so you don't affect that future the future that you're trying to avoid you got to make sure that you're preventing it from ever happening so it's uh it's it's complicated it's wonderful to behold and it never gets boring too because every time it's like dude this still didn't work like the everything that he's like different different things that he's trying to say that didn't work so how do we do this like well it's obvious logical conclusion undo in order everything that you did that got you there and the the learning curve that came with that uh that's what you could do with anime you can't really do with a movie so (laughs) that's what uh, makes it beautiful but yeah definitely worth watching Anyway, brother, thank you so much. It's good catching up with you on this Christmas Eve when we're recording this. Uh, yeah, it is recording. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's still a great conversation about all this. That um, I, I think we both yield to each other. We found middle ground on, on Ultimate with the Sis, and I think the conclusion is the same. Tana is the best and worst of them. <laughs> so real quick, where, where, where do you, uh, after seeing, because you've seen it a couple times now, where do you, mm. where do you put it? Where do I put it? Um, in his uh, in his repertoire filmography, films. yeah, it's not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna refrain because I haven't seen this in time. I'm gonna wait. I, I I can't I can't rank it because it's too soon. It hasn't. I haven't seen its impact yet on either me or anyone else. Right now, it's just been enjoyment. Um, 
so I, I, I need a little more time to digest it. Uh, so I'll, I'll see where it ultimately falls. Like du- like Dunkirk, it took me a while to digest that one too to see it for its ultimate strengths. Um, and I thought, wow, this is a this is a, a lot more master class of filmmaking than I than I gave it credit initially. Some people saw for what it was. Um, I was not one of those. They immediately saw for what it was because the, the the sound mixing and the soundtrack just were too jarring. Um, but then having seen it at home with my kids and all that, I'm like where my kids understood what was happening without even really understanding what they're saying. Uh, it's Nolan. That was Nolan's intent. It didn't matter if you understood English or not, that you'll be able to understand the situation. I know some people think Dunkirk is his masterpiece. I think Quentin Tarantino's in that crowd. Yeah, he did say that. He did say that. He said he was really impressed by it. He even talked about it recently. So I, I need Tenet to digest a little bit as I'm going to deconstruct it a little more because I feel like I still need to. But uh, it, uh, I, we're, we're talking about major classics on Nolan for the top five already. That's just tough to crack. So yeah, I say you know maybe we should say this because we, we have done kind of a lot of back and forth critiquing. When we're critiquing Nolan, it, it's a little bit different. It, th- this isn't about like trying to be kind of snobby and critique him. His films are worth critiquing. They're very much. Um, artistic endeavors they're artistic endeavors that can still appeal to uh the masses i mean he really pulls off a, a unique trick um in some ways better than say like stanley kubrick who he gets compared to a lot and that he does movies that still can manage to appeal to wide range of people make lots of money um and yet he kind of gets to do what he wants do concepts play around with um film structure that no other director would be allowed to because like that's that's not what you know our surveys say an audience wants to see um that's not, that's not what they like they're not going to understand this they're not going to understand that um and it's it, it's a rare thing that someone like him just really gets carte blanche to go i'm going to do this thing that might be highly confusing it's not structured like anything that you would normally market um and you know here's uh, 150 200 million dollars uh, go make your movie and you pretty much have final cut it, you know, it really is a rare thing. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, critiquing a Nolan film, it's because the anticipation is really high and that I would say even the ones that, you know, I'm critiquing, it's not like critiquing other movies. It's it's still, you know, I, I don't think there's been really any of his that I've really not enjoyed. There's more just a you, – you know that whenever he makes a movie, it could be this. It could, it could be up here. When, when he does it, so it, it's an incredibly high expectation um, when, when, when he does that. Um, I, I'd say maybe there's only been eh, maybe one. Uh, I might be in the crowd that um, I go back and forth on the Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> I've been both a defender. I've been both a defender of it, where I thought people were too critical, and then I've seen it and gone, "Oh yeah, maybe they were right." I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so. well, I'd say they're both right because other than that, it still has a cultural impact because it's it's the dialogue. The plot, the driving plot of it is just, it speaks to our times. Uh, the dialogue is just so great when it comes to just focusing on the the, the villain's mission. But overall, in his execution, um, the it, the continuity errors uh, and the, the what seemingly feels rushed in editing, uh, a, a moment of just Nolan-esque editing fixes the whole thing. That's what I always said. The unfortunate part is that in fixing it with editing, you might have to sacrifice the the opening scene with the airplane. Other than that, it's a it's a solid film. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I'm gonna need a little more time to digest Tenet uh, to see where it ranks um, in in all things. But uh, as someone that's just a sucker for this kind of c- uh, content, uh, well, you just look at the the body of work that he's done with the subject matter to some extent. Inception. He does manipulate time there, but because the dream space, Interstellar, he's dealing directly with uh, uh, um, uh, theoretical physics, and then you take quantum mechanics with uh, Tenet. So he's already touched upon everything that I absolutely love. So among the three, it's going to be three. So uh, in Inception second and Interstellar first. The way the way he structured uh, all of it, but there are very different sections of science that he touches on each of them. So, um, yeah, like I said, Tenet is more heavy on the quantum mechanics, in my opinion. Uh, Interstellar is theoretical physics and time manipulation, not time travel, just time manipulation in the dream space with Inception. So that you see what he wants to do. That's why a lot of us like, can you just give us your vision of a time travel movie? So now they got their answer. If he does it, they're not going to like the answer because they just saw Tenet. 
And those that enjoyed it will want to see it. Those that didn't enjoy Tenet because of its high concept will hate his time travel movie. It's not going to be a Back to the Future. That's the, it's just not. No, I, I, there, there won't be high picks like, uh, you know, Back to the Future. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like maybe he's taken that subject. Um, I, I kind of get the feeling that his next project is going to be something totally unrelated and that I don't think he probably won't come. No. Uh, he'll come back to it eventually because you can just tell he it's a subject he's drawn to. Mm-hmm. But I think he'll put a movie, maybe even two movies in, in between before he comes back to a script probably that he likes to, to come back. To he, like he's that. not his brother. He's not going to make those mistakes. His brother hit the ball out of the park with Westworld Season 1. If you really want to see all those concepts that I talked about, it's right there. If you haven't seen Westworld Season 1, that's the only one worthwhile watching. Just watch the first one and leave it at that. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. And with a, a, a climax that is just... Wow. It's, uh, it's just absolutely incredible. It's philosophical. It's, uh, it's um, physical. It's scientific. It's, it deals with everything, man. Um, and it deals with... Uh, um, oh my goodness. What is that expression? Something that's having to do with the birth of consciousness. Uh, but most of all, it's like, what is life? It's basically the question is being asked. Because in this story, the protagonists are robots that are discovering themselves. And I, that's what I hate. But it's also a metaphor for God creating man. Um, it's touched upon really heavily there. So it's like, huh. Like, yeah, but you're giving too much credit to, to mankind thinking they can create life, in this case artificially, and say, well, because it, it can think for itself, therefore, does it mean it's life? It's an excellent question that's worth asking philosophically. I know the answer. If it doesn't have a soul, it doesn't have a soul. There's a, a soul makes all the difference in the world. But now we're entering the conversation about what happened with clone humans. Do they have a soul? Like, well... Now we're really getting into complex stuff, but this is not talking about cloning. This is talking about humanity and its creation, robotic intelligence. Is it life? Should we give it the same kind of, afford it the same kind of rights as we would a human? But the way it's played out is just, oh, violent delights have violent ends. It's so good. That's why... What the hell did he, Jonathan Nolan, and Lisa Joy do with season two and three? They bent the knee to the woke mob and ruined what could have been the next great thing for HBO. I gave up on that show, man. I skipped it season three. There's no hope for it. Season four, I don't care. It went way off the wayside. But season one, there's so much to digest there. It's so, so good. But anyway... Uh, that might be my call for me to, to for me to go though. So thank, okay. thanks very much for connecting, brother. Uh, have... Absolutely, good to talk to you. And that does it for my conversation with Travis. So there were a couple of things, as I mentioned at the intro to the podcast, that I wanted to clarify. So I'll clarify them here, uh, and that's with respects to who the cinematographer of choice tends to be for uh, Christopher Nolan, and who did the cinematography for Tenet. So the cinematographer I was referencing was Wally Fitzer. He had since gone not just doing cinematography to move on to directing his own movies. So that's the that's the cinematographer that I was referring to during the, my conversation with, with Travis. So in his case, the last film that he and Christopher Nolan did together was The Dark Knight Rises. So I was right. It was one of those Batman movies, but I forgot that in between those movies was Inception. So The Dark Knight Rises was the correct movie that I should have referenced in terms of that. Every movie since then, since The Dark Knight Rises, uh, Nolan has been using a cinematographer, Hoyt Van Hoytma. I hope I pronounced his name right. Um, and I'm actually surprised that... Uh, he did Tenet because I did feel it was a bit different from his work with uh, Dunkirk and Interstellar. So I would have to put more of the blame on Nolan then for some of the caveats I have with the cinematography of Tenet. But other than that, it's just a great overall piece. Now, there is one thing that I didn't mention uh, regarding the whole entirety of my issues with dialogue that was actually summarized in one key 
a sequence that has been the most talked about before the movie came out and was changed before the movie came out and that is the dark knight rises because with the dark knight and the dark knight rises nolan released the prologue to each of those movies in the imax accompanying different um warner brother properties several months before the actual release of those films in the case of the dark knight rises there was a lot of complaints that people did not, did not understand what Bane was saying. So it's like, dude, what the flip is this guy saying behind a mask in a loud airplane? That was the only time I guess you could point to a Nolan responding to the criticism and then having to do a, a, a redubbing of the dialogue for the theatrical release, which is horrendous. But just giving you an FYI that it's it's become that big of a of a of a gripe with Nolan movies. It's 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 reaching its tipping point. I think that Tenet should be that that tipping point where Nolan has to finally address it properly and deal with it. Anyway, I don't want to get long winded. I already, I already, this has already been a very epic podcast. So thank you so much for listening. If you want to check out more of my stuff, by all means, go to my website, www.leandersegova.com. Check out the other stuff from off the record that you've been missing out on, especially before the end of the year, because you have access to all that without having to register. So check it out. All the different corners that I do, including my off the record podcast, which is exclusively there. And I'll see you on the next one.